Okay. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, I hope you are all keeping safe and well in the current certain time. I am Eric Tamiwe Tafak, uh, financial sector advisor within the Secretary of Making Finance of Africa. And today I will of essentially offici officiate as a uh, facilitator of uh, this uh, webinar. It is Indeed, my pleasure and honor to welcome you on behalf of Making Finance Work for Africa and our partner, ECO Business Fund, ECO Development Fund, and the United Nations Environment Program for uh, Financial uh, Finance Initiative, UNEP-FI. We are pleased to welcome you to this webinar on the topic of Bank as Agent for Biodiversity. There is an agent a need to sensitize financial institutions on the nexus between finance and biodiversity. The webinar will uncover the role of bank in the global the biodiversity crisis and so that they can incorporate the best, uh, uh, best principle into their processes to help sustaining ecosystems as well as hazardous and swing opportunity. Today we have a set of distinguished speakers from UNEPFI, the Natural Capital Finance Alliance, Finance is Motions, and the Green Digital Finance Alliance. Before we dwell in the into the topic of today, and as the program appear on the screen next, please, I will I will share with you uh, uh, some, I mean, the, that's the program of, the, of, the, of this session. So I will share with you some practical information about the webinar. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of a housekeeping issue, you need to know, uh, housekeeping point, you need to know that the webinar of today will last for about one hour and a half, including Q and A. And to ensure a high quality of this experience, all participants will be muted. The question can be submitted via, uh, via the chat box uh, and the Q&A, but we really prefer if you can use the Q&A uh, box. For live questions, you can raise your hand. Um, the slide and the recording of this uh, webinar will be shared within 72 hours, and they will also be available on our uh, our website, uh, www.mfw.org. If you have any issue, technical issue, do not hesitate to send a message to the organizer. And uh, finally, at the end of the session, you will have a questionnaire that will pop up. Uh, please, we will be very pleased if you can uh, really fill in these questionnaires and uh, so that will help us to improve our, the quality of our minute going forward. Next slide. Uh, allow me to share a few highlights on making finance work for Africa with you before we move into the substance of this webinar. Making finance work for Africa is a G8 initiative launched in October 2007. The secretary of, the, of the, the, this initiative is hosted by the African Development Bank. It is actually a platform for the harmonization and facilitation of financial sector development and knowledge sharing on the continent. Uh, we bring together the owner partner, African development, uh, governments, private sectors, and other financial sector stakeholders with the aim of unleashing the potential of African financial sector. The ultimate, ultimate, uh, ultimate goals being uh, to improve economic development, I mean, to accelerate economic development and reduce poverty on the continent. To do this work, we, are, we benefit from the support of a number of uh, institutional partners uh, essentially, we have the African Development Bank, the, the German corporations, the French corporation, the BIE, uh, BIE, which is the European Invest, sorry, the EIB, which is the European Investment Bank, the EU, the African banks, and the Dutch Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. We work along the number of uh, strategic pillars, which are financial inclusions, uh, long-term finance, and financial stability and governance. And our work essentially focuses on knowledge management, advocacy, and networking. Before I hand over to Jessica, uh, Mrs. Je Jessica Smith, who is uh, uh, the would officiate as the moderator of uh, this webinar, I will first of all pass the floor to Mr. Eric Wayama, 
for a quick introduction on uh, the eco business uh, eco business uh, fund and finances in, in motions. Eric is a senior officer. Is a senior officer officer sorry at the eco business fund. So Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hughes. Um, uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Um, my name is Eric Kwanyama, I'm Senior Officer in Charge of Technical Assistance um, with Finance in Motion, specifically for the Eco Business Fund. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. So Finance in Motion is, is an impact asset manager, currently with over $2.5 billion um, uh, dollars in assets under management spread across six funds um, that traverse uh, the developing world. Next slide. Within Sub-Saharan Africa, it advises the Eco Business Fund, which was initiated in 2019 with a mission to promote biodiversity conservation, sustainable use of natural resources and climate change adaptation and mitigation within the agriculture, forestry, aquaculture and tourism sectors. Next slide, please. Um, it pursues its mission through investments, uh, through direct and indirect investments um, in corporates and financial institutions in, in the four sectors that I just mentioned. And uh, it also has a complementary technical assistance facility that provides um, capacity building support to investors, as well as, as well as works with sector stakeholders to try and create a more enabling environment for main, to mainstream sustainable practices. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric, for this very quick highlight on uh, uh, the Eco Business One and Finances Motions. Um, with, with, on that note, I will uh, introduce our moderator of today, Mrs. Jessica Smith, as I said. But very quickly, I will say Jessica is uh, uh, the ecosystem lead at UNEP FI, uh, FI. Sorry, she has worked extensively to mobilize and evaluate environment finance globally and across Af Africa. She is clearly an expert a renowned expert in this field. For the past seven years, she has directed consultancy firms undertaking environment finance project development and evaluation and leading secretary for the Ecuador uh, Principal Associations, as well as um, uh, she supported the cross-sector biodiversity initiative. So Jessica is uh, really the person that we really, we wanted for this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica, for uh, agreeing to, to moderate these sessions. I will now hand over the floor to you for the next hour or 15 or hour and 15 minutes. You have the floor. Great. Thank you, Hughes, uh, for the generous introduction and uh, you know, to both of you and Eric for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so at, uh, at the UNEP Finance Initiative, we work with banks, insurers, and investors through different platforms like the Principles for Responsible Banking, the principles for responsible investment. We have a leadership platform with them and principles for sustainable insurance. And within the ecosystems theme, uh, we have a number of initiatives around moving um, private financial flows towards sustainable development. Um, so the Natural Capital Finance Alliance, we're part of the group setting up the task force on nature related financial disclosure. And we have um, uh, thematic work around the sustainable blue economy or oceans and sustainable food systems today. Personally, I've spent many uh, of the last 17 years of my career uh, working based in Africa, working around uh, the various parts of Africa or collaborating with African partners. Um, so I was really excited about this topic. And I think banks are a really important agent for change, uh, particularly when we think about small and medium-sized enterprises and the opportunities around biodiversity-based enterprises. Um, so I think, I think there's a great um, you know, uh, synergy here on this theme. I noticed a lot of the participants come from a, a finance background, um, banking, investment, and uh, business development. So I just wanted to introduce a little bit more about, you know, what is biodiversity and why is the African continent so important and exciting on this topic? So there's a lot of different ways to define biodiversity and, and our first presenter, Thomas, is going to, you know, delve a little bit deeper into that. Uh, but there are different ways to look at biodiversity. So uh, just showing on the map of key biodiversity areas for the world, which is on the right, 
you know, Africa has many of the terrestrial and marine biodiversity areas that are considered most important in the world. And also many of the important biodiversity hotspots uh, which have a lot of endemic species, you know, not seen anywhere else in the world. Uh, so it's very important from that perspective. And also, you know, we all know it's such a huge uh, continent. It also contains a number of different ecosystems and um, eco regions, which, which are very varied and unique, and they provide different human services and services to our societies and economy, as well as the environmental services. So biodiversity is vast. Biodiversity is uh, all around us. And you know, just on the next slide, I, I highlighted some of the biodiversity that um, you know is is familiar to me. Uh, but just to just to narrow it down, you know, we're talking about genes, habitats, and spe species. And we often talk about natural capital um, as being the the value that we generate from from those biodiversity components. Um, and I think Thomas will also talk a little bit about ecosystem services and, and how that relates. So, you know, as the African continent is uh, so full of biodiversity and actually contains many of the biodiversity leaders, uh, some of the banks around Africa, like Echo Bank, Ned Bank, Standard Bank, um, are really leaders um, in the biodiversity space. So it's, it's a wonderful peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange possible around the, the various regions. Today, we're going to talk about biodiversity as a compliance issue and the inter international norms a little bit. Um, look at the risks around biodiversity, and, and Thomas will delve into that. And then also the opportunities, the financial and development opportunities around biodiversity. And uh, uh, Federico and um, Marianne are going to delve a little bit more on that, uh, that exciting angle. So many uh, people working in sustainable finance are more familiar with climate change issues than biodiversity. And one thing to really note uh, the difference between climate and biodiversity is biodiversity is very localized. Um, and you know, it is an important um, angle to think about how do we manage these resources that are, are really fixed you know, to some degree by location, as opposed to the, to the climate uh, where emissions are, are global. We, from a compliance angle, there are international norms evolving around how financing relates to biodiversity and what are particularly the safeguards around biodiversity that are expected. From an international perspective, the, the IFC performance standard number six on biodiversity is, is very important and influential. And many commercial banks um, around Africa have signed up to the equator principles uh, to implement those performance standards. There, has, there is a tendency that it is um, you know, cheaper and easier to uh, access finance where, you know, where those international norms are, are adhered to. So that, that's a, a kind of a business case for thinking of it from, um, from that angle. And then there are in, uh, domestic you know, laws and regulations that also need to be adhered to in, in various countries. From the, the risk identification and, and management and mitigation angle, you know, many of the biodiversity risks are similar to climate change. And Thomas will go into those a little bit more. From the opportunities, there are you know, so many opportunities around using biodiversity as a development asset and thinking about the financial inclusion opportunities because biodiversity is mainly in rural areas. Um, and there are you know, often vulnerable livelihoods or uh, unexploited livelihood opportunities to improve people's well-being in those rural areas, which, um, which offers important strategies for example, when we're trying to recover from you know, the, the setbacks of COVID-19. Worldwide, the World Economic Forum estimates that there's 10 trillion in annual business value and 395 million jobs possible building on biodiversity by 2030. So there's no specific estimate for Africa, but you know, at least a slice of that is very enticing. There's also a lot of opportunities around sovereign lending. Um, and new proposals around nature-based sovereign bonds. So um, tying the incentives around sovereign lending to, uh, to environmental performance. And then from an, eco from an infrastructure development perspective, we rely on ecosystem services like water and natural capital can provide us with um, strategies for ecosystem infrastructure that, that helps us to deliver those services. So we have three fantastic presenters today. Uh, Thomas Van Vegan will talk about uh, embedding natural capital into financial decision-making processes. Federico Sinistra will talk about making biodiversity bankable. 
And Marianne Haar will talk about FinTech's role in enabling banks to de design nature positive practices. So I'm looking forward to this session and our Q&A afterwards. And uh, I will go ahead and um, move on to introduce Thomas. So Thomas um, and I work together. He is the Natural Capital Finance Alliance South Africa project leader for the Encore tool. So that's exploring natural capital risks, opportunities, and exposure. And he's based in South Africa and describes himself as an evangelist for nature and a green business pundit. So uh, Thomas works really at the interface of complex business, the environmental and social systems, and trying to embed a deeper understanding of the multiplicity and transboundary nature of emerging sustainability risk. So Thomas, I'll hand over to you to tell us a little bit about um, the work of the NCFA and, uh, and the Encore tool. Thanks very much, Jessica, and good afternoon or good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, look, looking forward to this um, uh, this session with you this afternoon. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So the environmentalist Tom Burke um, said that the viral disruption which we've experienced um, over this last year was a sudden and visible shock. You know, that commanded and got an immediate response. However, if you look at this picture and the graphics there, you know, climate change is one of those stealth disruptors. You know, it, its impact on our lives are remorselessly, I would say, more incremental uh, than the virus and all the more dangerous for that. Um, so, the you know, the reality of climate change is no longer disputed. We see it all around of us, you know, the loss of, of coral reefs, widespread flooding, uh, uncontrollable wildfires, uh, etc. Um, so climate change can therefore be considered as a, a threat multiplier within, uh, within the financial institutions and similarly exacerbates um, conflict. And I think we are busy dangerously reaching a global tipping point uh, with regards to that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is one of my very favorite um, cartoons and it's also a bit of illustration of some of the biodiversity which is close to me and which I can experience quite regularly coming from a South African context and the African context. Um, but biodiversity can really be seen as that elephant in the, the elephant in the room, uh, literally and figuratively, you know. So, uh, you know, we've um, had um, decades of focus on climate change and climate change um, impacts, but with very little regard for the impending uh, natural capital disasters that, and biodiversity disasters that, uh, that we're busy experiencing. Next, uh, <clears throat> next page, um, slide, please. So climate change has largely been the uh, primary consideration, like I said, for most businesses and, and financial institutions to date. Um, and this is further underpinned by the various global reporting requirements. So we're all very familiar with things such as the carbon footprinting and carbon credit um, uh, initiatives. United Nations Global Compact, all the world banks need to, to add, um, adhere to those, um, and the emerging principles for responsible investing and the principles for responsible banking, thanks to Jessica and, the, and our colleagues at the UNEPFI, and then the emerging task force on climate disclosure, the TCFDs, uh, which is currently, I would say, dominating the focus of financial institutions. Um, and this is obviously leading to a lot of other initiatives which we've seen emerge over the, uh, the last couple of years and starting, however, for that fact in Africa, which is actually quite, um, quite heartening to see some of the current um, records coming out. And I think, um, Jessica, you posted something recently um, on uh, um, LinkedIn with regards to a Zambian green bond being established and implemented. So the green bond uh, principles and those initiatives taking place. And then obviously a very strong drive that we've seen globally is this decarbonization of investment portfolios amongst others, you know, getting rid of coal or dirty energy, so-called dirty energy out of your investment portfolios. However, I must state that our society has failed to adequately recognize our dependency actually on nature and natural capital for that matter and the interconnected relationship of these aspects are poorly understood um, and known as well. The next slide, please. So coming back to, to this connection with nature, and as we all know, the, the possible emergence of the SARS-CoV-like viruses out of, um, out of nature and, and out of um, putting nature under stress, uh, Vincent Cheng and his colleagues at one of the research institutes 
as early as 2007 already had identified that the presence of large reservoirs of, co of SARS cove-like viruses in horseshoe bats together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China is just a ticking time bomb. <clears throat> and the possibility of a re-emergence of SARS and other novel viruses from animals or laboratories uh, and therefore the need for preparedness should not be ignored. And though, although it took, you know, uh, 13 years for the COVID-19 pandemic to manifest and wreak a havoc across the globe in a very short space of time, I must say. Um, the correlation with the destruction of nature and the <laughs> immense stress which we as a species are placing on the other so-called lesser species of the planet has resulted in an emergence of another global pandemic post-SARS, and obviously that's COVID-19. Um, and what we're seeing is potentially that this new normal that we're entering into is going to be something which is going to be recurring. So I'd I often like to refer to it as the Pandora's box. You know, we've literally opened the Pandora's box and we do not know what to expect in, in future years coming. So taking biodiversity and natural capital into consideration, in every single type of decision making process that we're involved in is critical um, for us to, to get an understanding of how we're going to um, future-proof um, businesses and the financial institutions uh, going forward. Next slide, please. So we're all asking ourselves, and I think you know, I personally can attest to it, and I'm sure every single person on this panel today and in the audience uh, can attest to us asking these questions throughout 2020 and even into 2021, the uncertainty that we went into this year with this great what now. And um, the, the famous economist Milton Friedman said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. Uh, when that, a crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the deers that are lying around. So this is certainly, certainly a time of uncertainty. However, I think you know, we've, got to, we've got to contemplate what this new future will look like and the regime that we're busy and this new regime that we've actually been put into, because we basically have gone through a somewhat other kind of tipping point over the last um, last year. Uh, and of one thing we are certain that is that we cannot go back to business um, as usual as the way we were. Next slide, please. So decisions for post-COVID world. I mean, there's currently a lot of debate around the reimagining of this new social and, and environmental and ecological regime and what this is going to look like and what the opportunities amidst this crisis that are starting to emerge. Um, and we're already seeing a lot of these types of initiatives. Um, the UN initiative of hashtag Build Back Better, there's a new deal for nature and, a, and the significant traction that's been taken in Europe with the EU, EU, EU taxonomy around uh, natural capital and biodiversity, greater social inclusion and the numerous green economic stimulus packages that I've also referred to previously. All to transition the world, albeit to a sustainable and a green future and a social trajectory. Next slide, please. Thanks, next slide. Thanks, so, you know, so coming back to this aspect of, let's get a bit into the technical stuff of what, so what is natural capital? So natural capital can be defined and within the encore, the work that we're doing, uh, our definition is a stock of environmental assets, which includes biophysical elements such as water, species, clean air, etc., and the physical elements which makes up the, the other non the inert components of our biosphere, such as minerals, geomorphology, and the sediments which underpin the formation of ecosystem services. Next slide, please. So looking at natural capital further in Encore, you know, it's a way of thinking about nature as a stock, if you have to put it in some kind of economic and financial terms that produces a flow of benefits to people and the economy. And as illustrated in the previous slides, it contains, you know, things such as natural capital, as what we have here, water, forest, clean, et cetera, and then describes the goods and services that natural capital provides, such as food and fiber, um, water, climate regulation, et cetera, amongst other things. And those are called ecosystem services. Um, and you can go and uh, have a look at detail in terms of the million ecosystem assessment that was done a couple of years ago. Um, and some of these types of services include provisioning services, which is a supply of food, uh, fuel, fiber, and timber, things like that. 
regulating services, pollination, water purification, climate regulation, etc., cultural services and support services, amongst others. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> so looking at how this impacts on, on the financial system. So what we look at, we call it uh, the dependency of natural capital on, um, on from the, the economy on, on natural capital. So any adverse changes in natural capital will have a potential negative effect on the businesses that depend on it. And this figure above shows the dependencies of the economy on natural capital and the impact such as pollution and waste in reducing um, that flow of goods and services to, to the economy. Next slide, please. I quite like this model because we're, we're ultimately trying to bring everything back to the SDGs. And this just fundamentally uh, explains the fact that the biosphere, and as I said, you know, um, in the previous slides, which makes up natural capital assets, ecosystem services, biodiversity, underpins, completely underpins everything else um, that we experience on Earth. So economic activity is fundamentally entrenched and dependent on, on natural capital and biodiversity and also healthy societies and the prospering of societies also completely dependent on, on the health of those ecosystems. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> I'm just going to glance through the next slide, please. Some of the, the risks and how we uh, perceive risk. We all know about the World Econ Economic Forum Global Risk Series. The next slide, please. And what we've seen evolving over the 2007 up to date is a increase of the prominence of, of um, natural capital slash environmental climate change related um, impacts taking place. And for the very first time in 2020, we had the top five risks and the top 10 risks with regard to likelihood and impact were all um, um, natural capital or climate change related risks. Uh, to business. Next slide, please. So a, a report that came out from the World Economic Forum um, in the course of last year just uh, contextualizes the contribution of natural capital to the world economy. And that figure came out to a 44 trillion that it, um, that it, uh, it contributes to the global GDP. So uh, really not something to scoff at and very fundamental figures those and some of this information that has come out um, with regards to these type of figures have all come out of the Encore platform as well, which we're quite proud of. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One of the fundamental aspects which we need to take into consideration is interconnectedness of risks and um, you can go and read up on this in the World, the World Economic Forum's reports. Um, and this just illustrates that all the risk are fundamentally interconnected with one another. Um, so climate change action will, um, or delay or failure for climate change action will result in things such as involuntary migration, um, you know, global governance failures, et cetera. Next slide, please. And this, uh, the IPBES Global Assessment Report of 2019 similarly provides um, some stark information with regards to the decline in ecosystems and biodiversity. I'm not going to go into any of this in detail, but uh, there's a clear illustration of this declining trend, which we really need to take very, ser uh, very serious, um, and as well with regards to the impending uh, extinction of mass extinction of species. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Looking at why natural capital is important, and I'm just going to gloss through these because I've alluded to them before. You'll have environmental change, which obviously impacts on your natural capital and then breaks a dependency relationship with the economy. And that is where the risk is for, for financial institutions and businesses alike. Next slide, please. And this just uh, provides a little bit more detail. So if you had a drought impact, um, you've got reduced uh, rainfall or water availability. Uh, you don't have uh, water availability to irrigate your crops. And that then once again translates into a non-performing loan. If you're in the banking sector and you relent to an agricultural sector, um, that is where your risk lies. And these are all natural capital risks and biodiversity related risks. Next, next slide, please. Just looking at some um, 
of these aspects and how they relate to, to your business directly. Um, as you can see, these are the ecosystem services, uh, provision of materials, processes, inputs, etc. And if you go down to the next slide, please, you'll see the economic you see the economic contribution of what happens when that um, relationship gets disrupted. Um, and just taking materials, for instance, so Unilever's margins on a frozen food plummeted by 30% due to an inability to supply codfish in their value chain. Um, so these become quite significant if you're lending money to, to Unilever and you're expecting a good, solid, um, sustainable return. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. I'm not going to go the, into these in any detail. Um, I'm sure they will be sharing the, the slides as well, the participations, uh, participants, but the next two slides just goes into a lot more detail with regards to uh, that type of relationship in the cost of managed pollination, uh, with specifically in California, um, in, a, in a nutshell, it is a ecosystem service that used to be provided for free by nature, which now has been disrupted and now which costs an individual farmer up to a million US dollars to bring in managed beehives every single year to pollinate almond orchards. Um, so quite a significant outlay, which is now got to be put in against the, the price of almonds. Next slide, please. And how does disruption risk affect your financial institutions? As you can see, environmental risk it is right across your operations and your portfolios. You've got exposure with regards to credit risk, market risk, reputational, operational, compliance, liquidity, etc. It touches every single aspect of your organization's business. Next slide, please. So just to introduce our Encore tool, I'm not going to go into it in any detail due to time constraints, uh, but you're welcome to look at those two links over there and to actually get access to the Encore platform. It's free, you've got to register. Um, this is what the landing page looks like. So when you do um, access that um, uh, Encore.naturalcapital.finance, you will get to the, the landing page, which looks like this. Next slide, please. And in, a, in the next couple of slides, just in a nutshell to show you how it works is you've got sectors which, are, which have different production processes, um, ecosystem services, looking at natural capital assets, and then looking at the drivers of environmental change, which would influence um, your ability to, um, to have your production processes and your ecosystem services supply those functions to your organization. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, that's just showing it in a different format, uh, but very much um, on the same basis as, as what I've indicated. Next slide. Um, and that just puts it into a very um, succinct um, uh, flow diagram looking at a, GIS, a GICS industry, such as food products. It can be agricultural products, which would be a sub-industry, looking at um, a production process associated with the production of food, large-scale irrigated arable crops. And what's actually fundamental is to, to acknowledge and to see that the multitude of ecosystem services that are associated with that specific production process. Um, so disruption in a lot of those. So what in Onco, when you go and um, explore the tool, um, you will also have an ability to see which of those ecosystem services are material to your production process and rank it accordingly and then take uh, informed um, financial decisions with regards to that. Next slide, please. Something that we're very excited about and that's going to be launched in the course of next month is the new Encore Biodiversity Module. So we focus Encore to date uh, specifically around natural capital, um, but obviously due to the immense global pressure and threat on biodiversity, um, UNEPFI has deemed it necessary and the, the NCFA team has deemed it necessary to actually put in something very specific about that. So while you have the Encore platform, which um, looks at the visual links between the economy and nature, um, we're trying to, to drive the notion towards aligning your financial portfolios with, bio, with international biodiversity goals and targets. Um, and as you can see, the two blocks. So if you go into the Encore module, 
which will be launched, the new mod, uh, biodiversity module, which will be launched, uh, as I said, in the course of next, uh, next month, uh, you will have the ability to, to access uh, this specific interface and then make your decision based on that. Next slide, please. Uh, and then just the biodiversity model itself, what you can expect. I'm not going to go into any detail about it, but definitely something which I'm sure that you'd be quite as excited as, as I am to go and explore and to see how that can benefit your organization in ensuring that you drive uh, alignment to these global targets, which Des Jessica's also alluded to earlier on. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, please do uh, log on to our website. We've got um, a multitude of, 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 um, of documentation, reports, and uh, collateral that would assist you in, in your journey with regards to embedding natural capital and biodiversity into, into your organizations and ensuring that it, it, it manifests and you make the right decisions with regards to your portfolio alignments. Um, going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jessica. I'm, yeah, I'm slightly over time. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much, Thomas. That's great. And, and there's just been um, case studies from Nedbank and Landbank released as well. So those are those are fantastic resources. There's certainly a lot to get your head around on this topic. And, you know, Thomas has laid out a lot on the risk side for banks. And um, as Thomas mentioned, the task force on climate related financial disclosure, you know, is encouraging um, many more climate related disclosures coming out of banks and increasingly banks will also be able to uh, be encouraged and, um, you know, eventually potentially required um, to uh, disclose on, on natural capital risks as well. So I think it's, it's there's a lot to absorb um, and it, it can be a very way, different way of thinking um, for the banking sector, uh, but, it, but it is important to kind of get ahead of, uh, of these changes that are, that are happening worldwide. And I think that the most important slide um, that Thomas had put up was the one around the SDGs and how, you know, we, we have planetary boundaries um, in the world that we live in. And, um, you know, in order to achieve the SDGs, we, we have to fit within them somehow. So I think that was a, that was a great uh, scoping on the risk side. And now we're going to turn a little bit more to the question of how do we make biodiversity bankable? So what are the opportunities for banks? And uh, you know, banks um, have so many opportunities in the biodiversity space. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of great examples uh, already around Africa. Uh, we wanted to just bring, um, or the, the organizers wanted to bring a perspective from um, Latin America as well, just for uh, a different uh, example of, of what's possible. So Federico Sinestra is going to speak. He's the investment manager for the Eco Business Fund for Latin America and the Caribbean. So in the past 15 years, he's been working with financial inst uh, institutions and real sector companies, ranging from agribusiness producers, small finance companies, to the largest commercial banks throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. His experience is really centered on structuring investments via debt and equity to address the changing needs of companies in the region as they compete in a changing market landscape. So Federico, I'll hand over to you to share uh, your presentation. Thank you, Jessica. And, and I think this is, uh, it was a great flow uh, by having Thomas uh, present ahead of myself because I'm, I'm gonna focus a bit more on, on making this bankable, how to translate this message through a financial intermediary, because that is a key concept that we need to address if we want to make these solutions scalable and if we want to have a, a lasting impact in, in the way uh, the business is, is, is done and in pursuing these environmental opportunities uh, related to biodiversity. So I'm going to open up a little bit with, with a history about the Eco Business Fund, because I think it, 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 it merits or it speaks for itself. Uh, the Eco Business Fund started in 2015 in Latin America. It is one of the funds uh, advised by Finance in Motion, an impact asset manager uh, that initially started its operations in, in, in Europe, in the European neighborhood, and uh, in 2015 decided to take a bold bet to, to finance uh, outside of its home market and to bring in a, a much more interesting or much more related investment thesis to the market. And uh, specifically, it is around finding ways to make sure that financial intermediaries can unlock the potential that, that, that we have uh, as, as a society uh, in terms of, of supporting and financing biodiversity. And 
and the importance of, of financial intermediaries is that they are the only ones who have the outreach and the capacity to really reach the, the broader uh, clients and potential uh, stakeholders that, that can make a change. So uh, what we've been doing at the Eco Business Fund and the Eco Business Fund has now over 500 million of, of, of dollars in long-term loans that are all being uh, done through financial intermediaries. And, and I wanna give you a little bit of a flavor of how we've done this, how we've reached a, 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 a program that, that, is, that is growing and, and within only, only six years, we have a, a cr been able to, to really a, a put a lot of attention if in, in terms of, of what are the opportunities, the bankable opportunities around biodiversity that, that are worth mentioning. And, and, and with that, a, I can perhaps leave some ideas for, for, for those participants. Next slide, please. Next. So uh, the, the Eco Business Fund started in, in Latin America, as I said, and, and, and we have a joint reality with, with the African continent. And, and it is probably that, that we have a, a very high share of, of, of highly important ecosystems in the world. And uh, we're also part of, of dynamics, of export dynamics uh, uh, to, the, to, to the entire world that have put pressure on these ecosystems. And the question was, or, or, or the or the, the idea that, that we had as, as a company is being able to make this, these two realities come together and, 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 and really understand uh, where we could have, where we could make a change in terms of, of, of understanding that, that, the, that the economic dynamic and, and the export dynamic of the different countries needs to be supported, but it also needs to work well and it also needs to position these countries so that they can continue producing uh, at, at increasing levels without hurting their capacity to, to produce into the future. So it, it again goes back to, to Thomas's points that we need to be very mindful of the way that the businesses are operating to make sure that they can continue operating, that they can every day uh, be better in terms of, of supporting these, these problems that we all see and that, 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 that are no longer theoretical, but are realistic and how we can translate this into actionable items and actionable financing uh, that, that is done through banks. So uh, in, in Latin America, uh, we have, uh, just as in Africa, some interesting ecosystems that we lay out there. But what I wanna focus my presentation on is how to convey and how to translate this message uh, through a, a intermediary, because at the end of the day, this is, this is a message that, that will need to be transferred through an intermediary, which has the outreach, the, the, the capacity and, and, and it has the potential to generate a business out of serving biodiversity converse, uh, conservation. Next slide, please. So the first problem we approached when, when we started uh, going to financial intermediaries in the region uh, with, a, with a biodiversity or a green focused, specialized or dedicated financing was that they say, oh, great. Uh, this is gonna be very helpful for energy. And the first thing that we said, no, we con consciously decided to leave energy outside of our mandate because uh, we believe that, that there is enough financing going to the, to the energy, renewable energy, energy efficiency level. So we wanted to target on, on more, more focused areas where we could have a larger impact. And uh, we decided to have four focus sectors, which were the agribusiness, the aquaculture, the forestry, and the sustainable tourism sectors. And all of these sectors are very intertwined with biodiversity conservation. And biodiversity conservation is critical, is central to, the, to, to, uh, to attacking any of, of, of these four sectors. And the financing that we've provided is all focused on these four sectors and is predominantly through financial intermediaries. We have now started to also tackle or target corporates directly. And, and that is very interesting, but I wanna focus my, my presentation on, on how to do this through banks, because that's where, where the bulk of our, of, our, of our resources are today. And because we strongly believe that if we wanna make a lasting change, we need to aggregate the financial intermediaries in this dialogue. And we need to have them see this as a profitable business because it, that in itself is going to be what drives this to be a sustainable change in time. This, this is not, a, I mean, the, the approach we're taking is, is, is really around making this commercially viable. And in order to make it commercially viable for banks, we needed to simplify. A, a, a bank has 
very many opportunities. They can tackle shoe production. They can tackle uh, food production. They can tackle very many uh, aspects that, that are relevant. And, and so we need to give them the tools to really understand and be more, more efficient and be able to understand the dynamics underlying some of these core problems that, that we've been discussing. And for that, we have decided to schematically position our, 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 our funding or, or the eligibility of our funding in two ways. One, which is related, which is borrower specific. And in the borrower specific uh, area, which is the first one that I'm going to tackle, what we have done as a fund, and, 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 and we have no affiliation to any of these certifications that, that, that you can see on the screen, but what, would you, what we have done there is gone with a lot of detail and with a lot of care into the world of certifications and chosen a set of certifications that we believe are closely related to making biodiversity and better use of resources viable. And what certifications are, for those who may not be uh, familiar with these, these are uh, certain voluntary schemes that a given producer or a given manufacturer can adhere to. And, and, and in order to maintain these certifications, they have to have a, a, a minimum, uh, which is in one part is in independent verification. So a third party needs to come in and assess that this given a, a person or group or company is following certain uh, criteria. And uh, this needs to happen on an ongoing basis. So through the certification uh, uh, approach, what we have said uh, as, as, as a company and where we think there is a lot of, of potential is we want to continue the flow of funding and we want to make it easier for those uh, producers in our region that are doing things better, that are ascribing to, to a, a more robust way of handling the ecosystem, uh, reality ecosystem services of the natural resources. And, and we want to continue making funds available to them. And so what we have done in this way is we've taken a group of, of certifications. In the case of Latin America, it is more than 30 certifications. And what we do to make this bankable, to make this tangible for banks, is we focus on each country with each group of, of, of banks or financial intermediaries in understanding this set of certificate, certified companies in their country and, and, and helping them see how they, how they have done things differently, how they're th doing things differently. And through that, I I'm just going to give a, a quick example. Uh, there's uh, one of our, our countries is very, very strong on banana production and banana exports. And the reality is, in our region, we are not there yet so that we can, as Latin Americans, consume or have a price premium associated to that banana production. That, that just doesn't happen here. I I'm sure it, it, it doesn't happen in Africa. But there are some markets who have already gone through different stages of development and where consumers are actually very concerned about these dynamics and are willing to pay a price premium for a banana that is produced ascribing to a higher set of standards. And, and that is what we want to translate. But since that buyer is willing to set aside a little bit more of its income to make a change, what we want to do is put it all the way down to the producer. Because what we've seen when we've analyzed these value chains is that a lot of the financing is staying in the intermediation, in, 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 in parts of the value chain where the lim there is a limited impact to make a change uh, with regards to um, the environment. So what we've done through this uh, certification scheme is try to take that premium that is, that is paid by the consumer in a hard currency or in a developed market all the way down to the end user or the end or the primary producer or the primary manufacturer of that of that product so that they can use that to enhance their relationship with the environment so that is a, a very powerful uh, approach it, it's simple the way we approach it is, is is we sit with the bank and we say listen these are clients that hold a, an eligible label for us we there are more labels these ones we understand very well and we can uh, tell you for example that a rainforest alliance banana producer in country x is for one part, having the environmental permits required, having the water capture uh, uh, systems uh, for their use of water uh, as per local law. And this may be a, a kind of irrelevant themes, but, but you won't know how important it is because the first thing that a banker in our region will say is, I, I think uh, 
primary production is very risky because there is volatility, there is compliance risk, there is environmental and social risk. And so I shy away from that. But if we can give them a short fix, a proxy to say, we understand these dynamics, we understand these realities, but there are ways to, under, to use other, other knowledge that is, that is building up to reduce these risks, or at least to have you be able to focus your attention on what is more relevant, uh, then the certifications play a very important role. Because for, for a bank in, in country X that is targeting the banana production, uh, having a, a, a Rainforest Alliance certified producer is very, very interesting because it already allows them to, to be much more relaxed about some of, 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 of these problems and some of, of, of these issues by relying on a third party audit and a third party certification. And what they have found or what we have seen now is that some of these partners that we have in the region are literally focusing their full origination for primary uh, production alongside the certification value chains. And they've understood it and they've opened up and they've gone for different certifications. So this has become very important. We have about 75% of our funding going to certified companies. And, and these certified companies also include social aspects. There is the fair trade uh, certification, which, which is very strong in the region, which also tackles a, a, a more balanced uh, supply and value chain throughout some of these commodities. So uh, we can, we'll be happy to elaborate a bit more on that. But in the, in, for, the, for, for time's sake, I'm going to move to our second approach, which is there are companies who are not yet certified and the certification has cost associated to that. And, 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 and there are investments that will take them closer to, to being certified or not even being certified, but being able to have a better perform environmental performance or having a, a, a lesser a, environmental footprint through their operation. So uh, what we have done here is, is also focusing on investment activities, no longer the, the, the recipient of the funds, but rather the uses of, of, of the funds. And this is a little bit more tricky because what, what we require here is that the banks have actually capacity to understand and to follow up on these. And, and so what we've seen is kind of a shift from initially, they, they follow a, a relatively straightforward approach that is easy to understand. And then they start seeing opportunities and they start moving towards more of the what we call the green list approach. And what, what to make it very simple, what we want to do here is, is for example, uh, for one easy example is, is irrigation. And we're very interested in supporting irrigation that is more efficient. And, and some companies, uh, in order to be certified, they have to have some performance in terms of, of the, the, the amount of water that they're using uh, with comparison to, to, to like-minded uh, or, 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 or similar uh, uh, projects or, or developments. And, and in order to be able to be up to par, they have to first have made some investments into, into different areas and, 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 and uh, irrigation is one of them. And what we've done there is, is actually supported banks in understanding what are the better types of, of irrigations that can help their clients be more efficient that can reduce the financing costs, uh, the, 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 the risk costs and, and, and various other costs associated to the business and made these clients credit worthy and more interesting and, and, and reducing the credit risk associated to those. And finally, we have a third sector where we're looking at non-standardized measure, everything that is not in these two, but has an environmental connection. We're also able to tackle it. And, and with this suite of, of, of relatively three products, we're able to make, a, we have been able to, to, to grow our fund. A, a, our fund is now a very relevant to the company. It's almost a quarter of, of the funding that we have deployed is in these four sectors and, and, and very concentrated more on the agribusiness and agri-processing sector. We've done quite a bit on, on aquaculture, which is a beautiful sector. There's a lot to be done. And, 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 and our, our approach there has been very interesting, but, but it's, it's more limited because it, it, ha it requires a certain reality. And in the forestry sector, we've done also quite a bit, but where we see a, a, a crispier or a nicer or a, or a connection that is much more relatable to, to, to income, to job creation, to environmental enhancement, to balanced regional growth is in the agribusiness space. And, and the first thing is that we, uh, that we look at, uh, at this and at, at the full value chain. Uh, and so we're not only looking at the primary producer, but we're also looking at the, at, 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 the, at the manufacturer or the transformation company, which is taking that primary production, which is done in a certain special way and is being able to take forward that value and that concept and uh, tweaking it in a certain way to make it a, a, a product that again, 
these are products that are, that are being consumed in, 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 the, in the developed markets. So, so let's not forget about the, the connection about exports and about being able to take this small producer in, in, in aggregating them itself or themselves into these value chains that at the end of the day are gonna provide them a little bit of an extra income to be able to tackle uh, the most pressing needs, which are, are, are very much going to be related around biodiversity and, and different uh, uh, opportunities around uh, nature. So with that, I move to the, to the last slide uh, that I have, and then I, I leave some, some examples there of things that have worked well. Uh, I'll skip the impact pathway, sorry for that. I mean, uh, whoever is interested, we have a very uh, much, uh, a lot of information on how we've done this, this impact mapping and how we've translated a 500 million worth of, of, of sub loans into actual tangible impacts, into less water use, into less herbicide use, into 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 higher amount of hectares with a, with certain qualifications or being handled in a certain way. So we translate all into that. That's going to be important. That is going to be key in the future for for getting more people interested. But uh, I want to use my last two minutes in 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 giving some concrete examples uh, uh, in terms of of the actual investments that, that we are seeing uh, being very interesting in the region and and one of them is around cacao and coffee uh, there is production under agroforestry systems uh, both in the cacao and the and in the coffee value chains there are different alternatives in how you can produce but there is quite a bit around uh, mixing the agroforestry and and this also applies to ca to, to, to to cattle uh, which is silvopastoral systems which is literally mixing better making it more conducive for these production landscapes to aggregate or to incorporate a, a, a biodiversity angle through maintaining a, a given set of, of, of forestation or through using a part of the production landscape to provide environmental services. And so here we've had a lot of impact in terms of, of coffee. We focused on, on certain countries that are very important for coffee production. And we've seen those that are producing coffee under agroforestry systems, shade grown coffee, basically. And we have been able to understand a lot of important environmental services associated to these productions. And, and, and we've focused our partners to be able to understand this and to also understand this from the commercial aspect, those a, 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 agroforestry systems around coffee allow for, for, for higher quality coffees that then also command a price premium. And then again, can, can, can go all the way down to that producer who for, for them to, to make sensible decisions of how to engage with nature and how to take care of nature as part of, of their business. So that has been very, very interesting. Uh, we've, we've done quite a bit around uh, farmed aquaculture. Uh, we see a huge uh, importance in, 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 in being able to to retain or to protect mangroves and mangrove environments. And what we've done there is, is helping producers to move up upland to, uh, to avoid producing in areas that can have a direct impact and, and in supporting them in, in, in also understanding the importances of, of mangrove. And at the end of the day, what, what, what we've been able to do is, is focus the banks in, able, in order to be able to, to they themselves understand what is the difference between a given producer that is producing in, 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 in a given way and one that is producing in a different way and how they can correlate that to credit risk and how they can build the origination associated to, a, to reducing credit risk by having clients that understand the importance of, of, of embedding nature within uh, their operation. And, and for the sake of time, uh, I, I'm going to stop there and, and I'll be happy to take any questions on, on, on more specific ways of how you can tell this message to a banker because he has limited time, but he has a very important role to play and you need to use that limited time in making it uh, very clear that it is both profitable, that it is credit sensible and that it will open up huge opportunities that are that are more and more being becoming uh, the norm uh, in, 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 in the world, I would say. And with that, you will see two other th three, three specific uh, financings that we've done in the fund that can spark some ideas. Uh, and, and, we, and, and in our website, you can also find some other ones and, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Brilliant. Thank you much, uh, so much, Federico. That was really inspiring and also very tangible. And I think those three takeaway messages, you know, being concise about profitability, credit sensitivity, and just the opportunities of changing norms 
are really important takeaways. So if we can, um, if anybody has any questions for Federico uh, or Thomas, and, and we're coming to the third presentation soon, please pop them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll come back to those at the, the Q&A session at the end. Um, now, Federico, you gave us so many great examples uh, of how we make biodiversity bankable. And uh, now we're going to turn to Marianne Haar from the, she's the executive director of the Green Digital Finance Alliance. And Marianne is looking really into the, to the future of how do we use digital finance in promoting biodiversity conservation? And you know, how can we harness the trends in the FinTech landscape for nature finance? And Marianne's gonna give us a few use cases. Um, so before, um, before leading the Green Digital Finance Alliance, Marianne was an advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark on digital finance in emerging markets. And she's also been leading the think tank Sustainia, working on technology for green finance. And uh, Marianne's also worked quite a lot around uh, West and Southern Africa. So Marianne, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you all for the invitation. Um, yes, so uh, what I'm going to share with you today, uh, and I'm gonna, not going to take too much time, so we have time for the conversations, is really what are some of the pathways that fintech offers uh, if applied to biodiversity finance, really to help to address uh, of the um, existing barriers, such as high perceived risks that we also heard Federico talk about, and assets that are too small for capital biodiversity data, which is location specific rather than economic activity specific. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to do that by um, drawing on some of our work where we have mapped out the global uh, fintech for biodiversity practices, but I'm going to share with you um, three main trends or three main pathways. It's uh, data capabilities that fintech brings for biodiversity footprinting and risk rating. The second is digital pathways for scaling. Uh, biodiversity finance. I'm going to focus more on that. That's the opportunity pathway. And the third is really transaction data for maximization of nature and carbon exposed behavior. And then I want to leave you, of course, uh, with some concrete steps that you can do if you're part of the banking community to also start on your own uh, digital biodiversity finance journey. Next slide, please. So currently really where most banks are uh, is that they are currently, oh, but that's okay. Uh, I, uh, so where most banks are, are currently at the stage of trying to understand their biodiversity exposure, right? And we also heard the Ancore tool can help you uh, on that, uh, but there are really no fully automated bio. There was another slide for this, but I can share that with you later, which sort of shows the footprinting tools. Uh, there are no fully automated biodiversity footprint tools on offer in the market. And for a very clear reason, because the data layer is simply missing. Um, we, uh, we have companies that tend to under-report on 150 databases that's been mapped out by UNWCMC uh, that are not related uh, to economic activities, but they have data sets that are related to locations difficult to connect to a security and thereby to your financial decision making. So really, uh, currently what we have in the market is that we have uh, six overall metrics for biodiversity. They do not leverage digital technology in the sense that they do not harvest uh, biodiversity risk behaviors of companies using IoT, set, etc. But these metrics mainly use existing databases on global trade flows, and then they ascribe a biodiversity pressure to the part of the trade flow that you are accountable to through your investments. Um, so that's the current state of the market. Of course, we have new regulation, uh, such as the taxonomy in the EU and the SFDR, which is currently shifting this uh, towards more precise biodiversity footprinting. And now we get to the, to the right slide that you see here, uh, which is, um, I wanted to share with you um, the, the, the fact that we have the missing data layer, we don't have, as we heard from Jessica, biodiversity is geolocation specific. So therefore we cannot only leverage a uh, company disclosed data because that data layer is simply not good enough at the moment. We have to go out and use earth observation data sets from sensors on ground, but also uh, satellite imagery. 
And depending on what jurisdiction you are a bank in, the, uh, the data layer or the earth observation data layer will be quite significantly different in terms of what you can leverage in your financial practices, both for risk and opportunity. I have taken what you see on, on one side of the slide is from China. Uh, China has, um, because of the war against pollution, has the largest, one of the countries with the largest number of sens sensor harvested data in the world. Uh, so this has been leveraged by, this is a picture from the IPE platform uh, led by Mr. Dr. Majun. So what he does on his platform is that he tracks 5,000 um, companies every, uh, 6 million companies every day. He uses 5,000 sources of emission data um, to convert that into a green credit score on, on a number of, on all these uh, companies um, in the Chinese jurisdiction. And he sells that onwards to asset owners and asset managers in the country. But of course, when you are a banker in, on the African continent, the data availability for you to do this, um, to do this automation of inclusion of biodiversity risk metrics into your financial decision making is much, much thinner. So just what I've put, took on the slide is really what are the data sets if you do not have available these sensor data sets uh, locally, you can leverage today and that is really mainly the open source data sets which is from government satellite missions. You have the European Sentinel-2 data sets that you see here, you also have the Landsat from the US and they give you data with 10 meters resolution. So you can actually geotag farmland boundaries. You can also determine farm diversification using this and you can understand the environment that is around the farm. And, but the, the challenges with leveraging if you are a bank, these um, satellite data sets is really the capabilities of analyzing them. So it's really the AI capabilities to really extract the relevant information uh, for you. Next slide. So I guess, um, yeah, I don't know, something happened with the, uh, unfortunately, with the, there was uh, some text on these slides um, that has for some reason turned black, so you cannot read it. Um, so uh, turning from really looking at leveraging digital data for footprinting and risk assessment uh, on biodiversity to really looking more at the opportunity pathways for scaling biodiversity finance. Um, I have divided this slide and that you can see into opportunities at asset level and at financial instrument level. So we look. At, so if we look at the first sort of capability that fintech bring uh, at the asset level, it's really automated identification of the most investable biodiversity positive or transition assets. Currently, there is an information asymmetry, and I think we also heard that in the previous presentation between the real economy on biodiversity and banks. And here you can really deploy algorithms on satellite images to identify biodiversity, whether that is forest or whether that is uh, organic and certified farming, as we just heard, that is most investable. And the most um, important capabilities that this gives you is that you can actually go back on these open source satellite uh, uh, repositories to, to essentially build a historic track record of those farmers and of those forestry assets. Uh, so you can put that into your models to see what are the return potential and what has that been over a number of years uh, of these assets. The second is really that you can digitize biodiversity um, assets um, from the ground up as well. Because if you only leverage satellite data, there will be quite a number of data gaps because satellite data is not granular enough at the, the moment today, or it's too expensive if you need it too granular to really pick up what is the soil fertility. So what is the microbiodiversity, the flora and fauna in the farmland that you're investing in, which is extremely important for, for the credit risk, uh, but also what is the pollinance, et cetera. You will not be able to capture that from satellites. So therefore there you will need to, as a banker, go in and help your clients to help digitize some of that biodiversity data, which is basically can put into your credit risk models. So through um, infrared soil scanning, which is available in the market and farmers can use them themselves, they're fairly cheap. They can capture the organic matter in the soil and the soil structure. Uh, they can also through soundscapes uh, in, their mobile, in their cell phones, uh, capture what are the pollinates, what is the richness, richness of biodiversity on their farm which has a correlation to, to, to the potential to produce there. So you can build that into the, 
to the credit, credit scoring regime and you can really get a whole sort of client photo from a biodiversity perspective. So the third, uh, the third capability is also the one that I think has most potential because it will complement what we heard in the previous presentation by Federico, which is really around how to leverage fintech to make these assets even more bankable or better business. So once you have digitized the track record and included new data from the ground up, you can start to really look at, first of all, aggregating smaller assets, as we also heard of from Frederico, and leverage digital to do that. Um, but you can also do uh, really enhance um, and start to create new value streams uh, by building up the biodiversity of these assets. Because currently the way we structure these types of green loans is through interest rate rebates, right? So you will basically link more and more pos biodiversity positive behaviors and reward that with an interest rate rebate. But what we also can do is what Rabobank is doing in the Netherlands. Uh, they have actually introduced a planet impact loan to farmers, which quantifies the biodiversity results of dairy farmers with the aim of developing new revenue models. So they measure on key performance indicators of the loan related to climate, land use, loss of minerals, soil, landscape and species. And farmers who perform well on these, they get an interest rate rebate, but they also get eco system payments from the local authority. So if they have improved the water quality by lesser phosphate, uh, et cetera, application on the soil, they actually get uh, uh, ecosystem payments. And in addition, and what is really interesting here is that Rabobank has also launched with this a carbon bank. And this is to enable the dairy farmers to monetize the increase in the organic carbon from improving the soil organic matter, which results in them behaving according to the biodiversity linked loan. So this is really to enable the farmers over time and Rabobank over time to shift away from having to give biodiversity linked behaviors a lower interest rate to building it into actually new markets by offering these farmers to be part of voluntary carbon markets through monetization of soil carbon. Um, and the last uh, capability is really around asset forecasting. So if you both have the historical track record from using satellite images, you have the on the ground uh, profile of your, your farmer's assets, the soil fertility, et cetera, you're in a much better position uh, to do asset forecasting of how it will behave in terms of increased return over time and how your, your risk will be managed uh, over time. And now if we look at the other side of the slide, which says financial instruments, what I will say there with the most important capabilities really that fintechs bring to this space is its ability to, in a cost efficient way, structure through digitization, smaller bonds or smaller financial instruments that corresponds better to the size of biodiversity assets. So if you tokenize a bond, we've tried, we've modeled and calculated how much can you actually gain in efficiency. And it's, it was um, a tenfold efficiency gain from a sort of classical issuance to a, a fully digital issuance, but also that you can open up your invest, biodiversity investment vehicles to crowd in new types of investors, uh, for instance, retail investors, which we've seen in a number of jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so this is um, what's mainly happening uh, in, uh, in Asia. And this is banks or fintechs with, with payment solutions that are starting to look at their transaction data. So your payment data through a green lens. Uh, so we work with the ant forest application in China. It has 7% of the world's citizens uh, that actually get automated carbon footprint on 18 of their behaviors. So whether they take the bike or the car, they get a carbon footprint and then they, they use algorithms to then uh, monitor whether you are shifting to a more carbon light lifestyle. And if you are shifting to a more carbon light lifestyle, you will get rewarded uh, with green energy points. And when you have accumulated enough energy points to, um, then they will reward you with planting an actual tree. Um, and uh, you can also, they've now started also to enable you to, um, to also get rewarded by protecting biodiversity. So you can plant a tree or you can choose to uh, protect an area 
uh, for the biodiversity to to uh, to be protected for a period of a year instead of planting a tree. Uh, and we saw this type of application uh, launched in the Philippines last year by, by Gcash, and it now has 6.9 million users after just a year and a half of operation. Currently, it's mainly for carbon, but what we want to incentivize these large mobile platforms also on the African continents, we're discussing that with MTN and Vodafone, is also to go in and look at their transaction data from a nature risk exposed behaviors perspective and offer people to shift to more plastic life lifestyle to less e-waste uh, heavy lifestyles etc uh, next slide please so this is the last slide and this is um really the data you see on top of the slide is is um the deployment of different types of digital technologies by funds today uh, and there you can see that the earth observation or the geolocation data sets, which are so important for both risk management and opportunity development within biodiversity finance are the least leveraged. And they're also the least precise at the moment. So it's a space that will be evolving uh, quite rapidly and especially as a response to increased regulation uh, over the next few years. So what can you do? Well, um, rather than starting sort of looking at your data assets across the entire bank to identify data sets with green capabilities. Our proposal would really be instead to start with identifying a use case in biodiversity finance that you believe will drive value for you and your clients. And then really look at what are the data assets you have today, which you have maybe not leveraged from that perspective. Identify what is the data gap how can you, do you need to go to satellite data? Is it the farmers themselves? You help to digitize part of their green asset data? Uh, or do you get it through APIs working with, with, with other digital data sets in your jurisdiction? And then really use that to go into innovation to a biodiversity digital product design and service development. This is the last slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm looking very much forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Marianne, and, and um, you know that it just points to uh, the exciting future ahead and, and one of the comments was we need to move with speed and I think some of these fintech tools really help to do that. Um, when you mentioned, you know, the opportunities to be rewarded by planting trees, you know, I was thinking about the livelihood opportunities, you know, the Kenyan Greenbelt movement and the, um, the Great Green Wall across the 11 countries across the Sahara and the Sahel and thinking, you know, what future um, could we have uh, harnessing these tools. So we don't have, uh, we don't have too much time for the discussion, but there's a, a kind of recurring question around um, biodiversity friendly investments. And I wonder, Federico, if, if we can call on you and just um, ask, you know, are you aware of any list or screening tool for biodiversity friendly investments? And, you know, maybe um, you could also comment on how do you, you know, how do you measure biodiversity impact? Great, Jessica, thanks for the question. It's very interesting. Uh, the, the biodiversity compliant investments will depend specifically and, and, and on, on what it is that, that certain investors want. So we do have a list, that's that's the list that we are pursuing, but we don't want uh, to share this because we don't want, we, we don't think it is exhaustive enough. What we, the way we go about this, Jessica, is is we this is not a top-down issue. We we cannot go and, and say to, to our partner banks that they need to finance a, a, B, and C. What we do is we go with them and we say, what are you financing and what from those financings is subject to a better performance in terms of biodiversity and we start building this uh, uh, bottom up and and so from uh, from our particular experience and, and, and i just want to be very clear that this we're just one uh, stakeholder in, in in this immense blue ocean and but we're making some inroads and the way we've done it is with, we've literally sat together with each potential partner institution and we've said to them where, which are the most relevant sectors? Because there are a lot of opportunities, but in order for this to be scalable, we want to see the areas where they are because they know this already. They, they have assessed credit risk. They have gone and, and they've done quite a bit. And, and so the way we do this is we extract from them, from their businesses. So if a given bank is very focused on, 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 on coffee and cacao, then we, we start 
presenting what for us a, it would be biodiversity sensible investments. What I, what I can do is I can share a, a link where we've mapped this a, a, or we've grouped this a, ourselves into different themes. And then a, we'd be happy to, to, to follow on on specific a, investments that, that may be a, a more correlated. But one, one is, is very much tied to, to Marianne's prior presentation, which is a, the, the cattle, a, a, space is very important in Latin America, and I'm sure in some parts of Africa. And before, uh, satellite monitoring seemed to be something very far off. So, uh, this is for NASA and, and, and for other people. Well, actually, in reality, it's no longer the case because it, it, there are a lot of data sets, and, and Marianne pointed to a couple, but there are other ones. Uh, there, there is one company uh, which is also supported by, by, by United Nations, which is the Global Forest Watch Initiative. And what they've done is they've taken these data sets and they've made it publicly available to all, and, and I'll put in the chat box for, for anybody who's interested. And what this tool does is it allows any user to use satellite data to see changes in forest landscape. And, and, and that literally is deforestation. And when you're approaching a sector such as the cattle sector and you're concerned about the potential impact that your clients may be having on deforestation, you may wanna see uh, in the map uh, how this, th their performance is doing. And you may wanna segment this into, into those who have been able to, to do things in, in, in a certain way versus other ones who have done them differently. And, and at the end, this should be embedded in your credit decision because a, 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 a client that is doing sensible, uh, environmentally sound uh, practices is going to be a better client. It is already a better client and you should be providing better financing services to them uh, versus the other. And in that way, kind of making a, 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 the, the allocation of resources commercially uh, uh, tied to, to, to this and, 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 and exploit uh, from that, Jessica. So I'll be happy to, I'm gonna put this on the chat box now and I'll be happy to follow on with any specific questions around given sectors, uh, which is where we've been more, more effective. Tying this biodiversity to cacao, to shrimp production, to banana production, to uh, rice production. And there it's, it's different because the investments that, that have an impact in biodiversity in rice are very different than those uh, with cacao. So I, I just don't want to uh, venture in, in proposing a list that may not completely capture all the opportunities that there are out there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Federico. And I think we can squeeze in one more question. Uh, so Marianne, I hope I can call on you on, on this topic. Um, I, I think it was very uh, good that you mentioned rangelands and, um, you know, we also had, uh, Marianne mentioned soil um, sequestration and, um, you know, forests and mangroves have come up as well. And I think I think what's exciting here is um, biodiversity has, has multiple benefits and managing biodiversity well means that ecosystems can better sequester carbon um, and that unlocks opportunities in the, in the global carbon, carbon market that presents new fin financing sources, um, new sources of revenue, um, you know, to the African continent. I wonder, Marianne, if if um, if you would like to say anything around the benefits from the carbon market linked to uh, to green digital finance, and uh, no, noting we only have a, a few quick moments left before we need to wrap up. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we need to build into the biodiversity assets, as you also say, and what we discussed before, so that we can move out to out of the situation that biodiversity is something that needs a rebate if you finance it. So rather, this is something that can enhance the asset. And at one point in time, we would be able to go to zero interest rates, right? Because you would be able to then monetize the, the either the soil carbon or the carbon from sequestered from the trees on your farm when you're doing more diversified intercropping, uh, for instance. So I think that's the regime we need to do more experimentation with now. We've really proved the biodiversity or nature linked bonds and the SDG linked bonds. Now we need to move exactly into to enhancing the assets so we can have zero interest rate uh, biodiversity uh, type uh, instruments out there to really scale like we talked about with speed right fantastic well thank you so much that's a perfectly succinct uh, response and um, this has been such an interesting session for me i hope for others as well uh, the 90 minutes just flew by um, so i'll hand over to hughes uh, who will uh, close us out and uh, thank thank the panelists thank you very much Okay. No, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, thank you really for moderating this very uh, uh, enlightening sessions. Um, what I will say that it's quite challenging to do justice to such a topic in one hour and a half, but uh, clearly we have been exposed to the various 
uh, facet of uh, this concept of biodiversity and the connection with the, the bank and financial sector broadly. Uh, in terms of key messages, we could say that uh, I've, uh, I took away that uh, biodiversity, biodiversity is localized. Uh, it can be used as uh, or considered as an asset in development finance. Um, we could also say so when you are speaking to the bank, uh, be very straightforward and really think about uh, like uh, profitability, credit sensitivity, and the opportunity that can be generated from biodiversity. It will make your uh, conversations uh, easier. And finally, um, I understood that we need in the process of um, uh, uh, moving the speed, fintechs uh, have a role uh, to play in accelerating the, 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 the current trend. Um, um, clearly, the uh, financial sector has an important role to play in the preservation of the world biodiversity and eco ecosystem. And there is a strong case for to mobilize the financial sector uh, in Africa uh, uh, around this, uh, this global agenda. Uh, making finance work for Africa will uh, like to take a more proactive approach in promoting sustainability uh, uh, broadly in the financial sector through our key instruments that are advocacy, knowledge, dissemination, and policy dialogue. In this respect, we are really eager to forge fruitful partnerships um, uh, and we hope to have follow-up conversations with our partner after we conclude uh, this, uh, uh, this webinar. On this, I would like to reiterate our thank to our excellent speakers of today, starting with our moderator, Jessica, for the good manage, Jessica Smith, I should pronounce the full name, for the excellent moderations of uh, this session, the good management of time, and um, for the discussion that has uh, as followed. They were very enrich enriching and enlightening. And uh, on that also, I would like to thank our presenter, the three the presenter, Thomas, Van Vegans, Federico, I will not go to maybe over, and Marianne um, for, for, for their insight. They share a lot with the audience. Special thanks also to Eric Wayama, John Cage, for helping to put together these excellent uh, programs and, and panel. We extend our gratitude to your institutions as well uh, for all the work that you have been doing in this space, and we really hope that we will leverage our respective strength for the future. Uh, for this webinar, we had more than uh, 280 uh, particip uh, registered uh, participants. At the end of the day, we had more than 100 uh, attendees, which is quite uh, a, a significant. Amongst them, we have representative of commercial banks, development banks, central banks, and also academics. Uh, also, the development partner, uh, development community, this is a good testimony, testimony to the interest of the topic for to our audience. And I would like to thank the attendee for making the time to join these webinars and for being so uh, proactive. We appreciate your comments and questions and hope that uh, the feedback you received met your, your expectation. We will see how to address some of the pending questions and share the response with you afterwards. Finally, uh, please be aware that uh, the recording of this webinar will be, and the presentation will may, be made available to you uh, after the, the, we, we, we wind up the, these sessions. Uh, and probably I would say within 72 hour, uh, 72 hour maximum, which is three days. Um, uh, we'll, we will on this also request your cooperations uh, to in filling out and filling in the survey that will pop up when you close, uh, the, the, you leave the sessions, it will appear uh, on your screen and please just uh, fill in. That helps us to improve uh, the quality of our women, women uh, going forward. Do, uh, do enjoy your, the rest of your day. Uh, we are very pleased to have you all. Bye-bye and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.